Friends, hear the sound of the living water in which we were all welcomed and called and claimed as God's own. Very little this morning. <laughs> Friends, hope does not disappoint us, for God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us in our baptism. Believe the good news. In Christ we are forgiven. Let us give thanks to God. hospitality, God's welcome to us is abundant and steadfast. May our hospitality to one another be just as full of grace. Peace, the peace of Christ be always with you. Good morning, peace God. be with all. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be, peace be with you. Good morning, God's peace be with you. And with you, Susan. Thank you. Peace, oh, everybody. God's peace to you, Alan and Ellen. Oh, gee, it's good to see you. Peace be with you. It's so good to see both of you this morning. Good morning, John. Good morning, Susan. Peace to you. Thank you, and also to you. Peace be with you, Susan. Thank you. God's peace be with you. I can't see who you are. Uh, I'm Rick. Oh, you're... Yes, you're uh, yeah, Janine's, Janine's friend. friend. Yes. yes, I don't ever remember your name, but I know the church. <laughs> yes. No, it isn't. Oh, they used to be Hi, <laughs> Good morning. <clears throat> Almost there, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I hope you all are well. I am. Good. I'm in Maine visiting uh, with Rachel, visiting my son and her brother oh. and his oh. family. Oh, that, that must be wonderful. Is the weather nice there? Lovely. Just lovely. 
have the trees started to change yet? Just barely. Just barely. Just barely. Every so often you see one, the side of which has been uh, uh -huh. crisp. Yeah. <laughs> but and it must be nice now. It must be nice now because the tourists have gone and. Uh, uh, I don't know. A lot of people come here for the color. Oh, really? The, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. I know a lot of people summer there. Yes. Well, we're inland. We're in central Maine. Okay. okay. <laughs> Rachel says you have to really want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> This is a two and a half hour drive from Portland and uh, about 45 minutes from Bangor. Okay. Good morning, church, and welcome to worship. Whether you are here in person or whether you are with us on Zoom, it is a joy to be with you this morning. And if you're a visitor with us, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome on behalf of all of us here at Brown Memorial. It is always a joy to have visitors with us, and we would love it if you would let us know who you are by filling out a visitor card that you'll find in the pews or in the chat box, or in the chat box on Zoom. And for all of you who are here, we hope that you will join us for lunch immediately following the worship. Um, it is potluck today, so you're not gonna wanna miss it. And even if you, like me, forgot that it was potluck, and didn't bring anything or were unable to bring something, come anyway. The important thing is that you're there. And immediately following, well, actually at about 12.15, we may still be eating, um, the faith explorations will begin uh, for the year, what was previously known as the Adult Ed Hour, Adult Education Hour. And today we're going to be starting a three-week series on hospitality, which is arguably the very heart and soul of our Christian faith, of our biblical faith. So please join us, um, and our sermons will be focused on that for a few weeks as well. Um, it has been quite a week at Brown. I feel like I'm Garrison Keillor saying, what a week at Lake Wobegon. At one point this week, not only was our brand new sound system out, but the elevator was broken, the, the phones were out, and the internet was out all at once. They're all back now, we think, and so this is a really good moment for us to remember to give thanks for our incredible facilities manager, Keith Moore, who shepherded us through that with such good humor and patience and skill. So we got through this sort of craziness, and we think everything is working. If you have any trouble with the sound system, let us know. I can't entirely tell. I'm just immensely grateful for not having those nasty earpieces. So um, on a more fun note about this week, yesterday was the um, uh, Bolton Hill Garden Walk, which brought over 170 visitors into the church, which is extraordinary, and it's wonderful. Um, and many thanks to Carol Milford my burden to Barbara Francis for helping out. Five people walked the labyrinth even, and many expressed an interest in coming back to view the windows. We passed out two dozen, um, two dozen organ recital programs and did a bit of evangelism, and one young man even stayed and meditated for over 30 minutes. So we're looking forward to our Faith Explorations Hour presentation on the Labyrinth on October 27th and a restart of the opening of the sanctuary um, for public meditation time. There is a lot else going on at Brown um, these days, so please read the announcements at the back of the bulletin. I'm going to mention only a few of the most immediate items. This evening, Middlers, Sunday Supper and Games, that third to seventh graders. If you have questions about this or about any of the youth activities, you want to see Eva, 
<laughs> um, she has all the information you need, but there is more information in the bulletin as well. Wednesday, September 21st, it was going to, um, September 25th is going to be the first meeting of bookworms at Brown as they begin their nine-week study of Walter Brueggemann's book on the Psalms, which is called From Whom No Secrets Are Hid. And there are only two spaces left, so sign up for this opportunity. Again, more information is in the bulletin. Sunday, the 29th, retirement celebration for Sharon Holly. You should have received a, one or two detailed emails um, about this. Um, one of the message lines that you will show up in your email, at least it did in mine, says September 8th. It's not September 8th, it's September 29th. Um, so uh, just uh, the, the main announcement says September 29th. So get all your information there. Um, October 5th, Festival on the Hill. And again, Brown will be doing the sweets table. So please um, be keeping an eye on the bulletin for information. We'll be reminding you here. And um, get ready to bake away. And we need people who will sign up also to help with the whole project. Um, the Cuba, Cuba Partnership Team needs our help. Um, as they mentioned last week, they have invited members of the Kamahuani session to visit Baltimore. But in order to make that happen, they need to raise $4,500 in the next week, so by next Sunday. Um, there is a giving link with the announcement in the bulletin, and Sarah Ramirez Cross is um, back by a table back there to answer any additional questions. Um, Sunday lunch crew. So for those of you who have helped out with Sunday lunches and we're starting up again, um, there has been a Sunday lunch crew group created on CCB to, mix, um, to streamline the whole process of signing up. More information with a link to join is in the bulletin. Um, so please, there's just so many other announcements in the bulletin. Read them, by all means. And I'd like to call your attention to the prayer list. And first, um, an apology. Um, accidentally, old prayers were copied into the bulletin for this week. So things that are way outdated are in there. A couple of new ones are in there, too, but the old ones. Um, there's no way that Camille could have known that at that point, and, and um, it, we didn't catch it, but there it is. So just be aware. Um, and this week, I would ask you to especially keep Rachel Cunningham's dear friend, Kim um, Scaglioni in your prayers as she faces a very complicated hip replacement this Wednesday. And an update on Ellen Fisher. The good news is that um, she finished her radiation treatments on Thursday, but the side effects are intensely unpleasant right now. So please continue to hold her and Al in your prayers. And Louise Wagner needs our prayers. She is in Ireland and she has COVID, and she's feeling miserable. She was feeling too miserable to even get on a plane and come home. So please keep Louise in your prayers. Um, and now I would like to invite Rose Glorioso to come forward, who has something she would like to share with us. Can you hear me? Uh, thanks, okay. guys. First, let me say that this was not planned. It's not part of the service. And I'm, uh, I've got the chutzpah enough to ask uh, at the very last minute to be able to address you um, because I feel like it's important. So if you have any complaints, come to me. That staff is already beaten up. Hey, Rose. Yeah, we, we can't hear you. They cannot hear you. Wait a second. Shall I start again? Uh, yeah. oh, no, no. All right, I will Just start go. with the fact that I shouldn't be up here, but I will say, <laughs> uh, first of all, I've been hiding something. Have you ever thought that, you know, you're, you're living through your life and you're sleeping through something? Well, this week I woke up and I'm angry. Um, most of you know that I'm from Baltimore, uh, or some of you do, 
Um, now all I do. And but what you don't know is because I have hidden this fact uh, because I've been ashamed of it. I don't know what that says about me, but pray for me. Uh, I, can't, I had an opportunity to look through the map, the redlining map, and the black butterfly, whatever. And I realized that I grew up sandwiched between Lakeland and Lansdale, neighbors to Stone Throw from Cherry Hill and Curtis Bay. It was a tough time. We were poor. Not only were we poor, there we have to say that we were dysfunctional. I'm just talking about my family now. Um, we, we all are, absolutely. But uh, we, we probably would win some prizes. Um, and there was abuse. And uh, why am I s telling you all of this this morning? I'll tell you why. I'm angry that I haven't shared this before. Bill needs our help, and I'm uh, probably going to get thrown off the committee because they don't even know that I'm doing this. But we really were not just asking you to show up on uh, October 6th. We're also asking you to uh, maybe make a donation. We're trying to raise, I think, a little less than $7,000 for Brown alone and $75,000 for the, the uh, city. I think I have those figures right, but I'm sure I'll be corrected if not. Anyway, I'm pleading you for you because coming from where I came from, I'm probably one of the few of you that has no formal education, no formal degree, whatever. And again, that's something that I've hidden. But you know what? I worked two jobs from the, I started working at 16. I worked two jobs until I was 30 to be able to make it. And I'm stronger for it. I also want to tell you that there is a price to be paid because I found myself here at Brown Memorial, but there are people who don't. They never get out of that. They never get out of that struggle, that turmoil. So the next time you see me coming at you like a bull out of a china shop, recognize I'm as fragile as I am fierce. But I'm here to tell you, you gotta give your money to Bill. Thank you, Rose. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your presence and your love. And I'd like to invite now the third and sixth graders to meet their teachers at the assembly room door over there so that they can go to Sunday school. And the younger children will go to Sunday school after the time with children. And they are invited now to join Reverend Janine up front. These are much easier to use. First, I'm going to give a shout out to Michael because Breathe on Me, Breath of God is one of my favorites. Thank you. Hi. This is a little tricky, isn't it? <laughs> You're a little more behind me than I was expecting. I want to ask you about a word. Can you come around a little bit? Pastor Gretchen said a few minutes ago, that word is hospitality. Have you ever heard that word before? Hospitality? It doesn't have anything to do with being in the hospital. That part really confused me at first. Okay, hospitality is when we welcome somebody, whether it's somebody we know or even somebody we don't know. When you have some guests in your house, or you meet somebody new at school, when you say, hey, do you want to come have lunch with me? Or do you want to come play with me on the playground? Or do you want to share my toys? Those are all ways that we can show hospitality. And one of the people who was really good at showing hospitality was Jesus. He made a lot of people 
were very upset because he talked to and had meals with and associated with people that other people didn't think he should talk to. But you know what? There were also times when Jesus didn't quite get it right. Can you believe that? I always thought Jesus was perfect, didn't you? That he didn't ever make any mistake? But today we're going to hear about this one time where he was a little bit rude to somebody. And she stopped him. She said, you know what? I'm sorry, but I deserve to be treated better than that. And he realized his mistake. And he said, you're right. You do deserve better treatment than that. But the lesson that we can learn from that is that even when we make mistakes, do you guys ever make mistakes? Of course. We all do. Every, all the time. But even when we make mistakes, we can correct them. We can say, you know what? Let's start over. Or I was wrong and I'm sorry. Those are all great ways to recognize when we sometimes don't do things maybe the way we should. So I want you to remember that through this week, okay? All right. Let's have a prayer. This is just a listen prayer, not a repeat after me prayer. Dear God, we are thankful that even in those times when we don't get it right, you always give us a chance to do better, to say I'm sorry, and to be more like Jesus. Thank you, and amen.
Speaking of mistakes, I made a mistake in inviting Janine to do time with the children because she just did in three minutes what it's going to take me 17 minutes <laughs> to do. Um, but here we are. Push forward, we will. Listen now for this reading from the Gospel of Mark that you heard summarized. Um, I think I will just finish halfway through today since my focus will be on the first part of the text and you can read the second part yourself, if you like. Listen now for a word from God to the church this day. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And when she went home, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Please join me in a word of prayer. O oh Lord, uphold me, that I may uplift thee. Amen. Now, the book of James that you, you heard earlier is considered to be a book of advice for how Christians ought to live, which is confusing since Jesus himself seems to contradict its advice for today. The tongue is powerful, James says. It can bless with power, and it can also curse with deadly poison. That's why not many of you should become teachers, because the minute you open your mouth, it can go either way. Blessing or poisonous curse. When Rabbi Jesus opens his mouth today, it is more on the poisonous side. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. He says to a worried mother who has come seeking healing for her daughter, who is possessed by an unclean spirit. He says to her, this healing is not for you because she is an outsider, not part of the Jewish people to whom he has been sent. Now, even if you grant that there is nothing philosophically wrong with Jesus understanding himself to be sent first to his own group, certainly there are nicer ways to say that to a worried mother other than calling her a dog. I mean, if someone came here seeking help and I said, you know the word, we don't serve non-members here, I'd be fired, probably defrocked, and for good reason. It is the opposite of the hospitality lessons that we're striving for, the ones all through the Hebrew scriptures that Jesus himself would have learned as a child. Now we could just rationalize it by saying that Jesus was having a bad day. Everybody has a bad day now and then. The text kind of sets it up to sound that way. He goes to the region of Tyre, which is out.
outside of his usual turf. Maybe he's a little nervous. Or maybe he's really tired from the travel and the crowd since he enters a house and wants people to leave him alone. The Gentile woman probably knows this already. She's likely heard it from Jesus' followers outside the house. Nevertheless, she persisted. I guess there are some readers who might conclude that she had it coming. Yet I wonder if Mark's vision of the reign of God that is marked by generosity and hope and justice is actually better served by seeing Jesus as a little less than perfect. And I know this flies in the face of orthodox teaching, not to mention the book of Hebrews that proclaims that Jesus was tested as we are, yet without sin. But what if being without sin doesn't have to be the same as being perfect? In fact, what if the idea of perfection itself, at least the way we understand perfection in our culture, meaning never making mistakes, what if that pursuit was more likely to lead us into sin in the first place? That is the conclusion that the Center for Community Organizations, COCO for short, came to a number of years ago when it published their report on characteristics of white supremacy culture inside of organizations. One of the reasons to attempt uh, naming characteristics of white supremacy culture, they argue, is to point out how organizations that unconsciously use these characteristics as their norms and standards make it difficult, if not impossible, to open the door to other cultural norms and standards. What surprised me about the report when it first came out a number of years ago was reading that Coco had named perfectionism as one of the characteristics of white supremacy culture. They describe a perfectionist culture as one in which mistakes are seen as personal, reflecting badly on the person making them as opposed to being seen for what they are, mistakes. In a perfectionist culture, there is little appreciation expressed for the work that others are doing, they write. When appreciation is expressed, it is often directed at those who already receive the most credit. In a perfectionist culture, it is more common to point out how a person or their work is inadequate. Moreover, it is common to talk to others about the inadequacies of a person or their work without ever talking directly to the person in question. In a perfectionist culture, making a mistake is confused with being a mistake. Doing wrong is confused with being wrong. There is little time, energy, or money put into reflecting as a group and identifying lessons learned that could improve practice. In other words, little or no learning from mistakes. And finally, in a perfectionist culture, there's a lot of splitting hairs and nitpicking. People bring up every imperfection in others' contributions or find exceptions to generalized observations that may be offered. Coco offers a number of antidotes, what they call antidotes to a culture of perfectionism, including things like emphasizing a culture of appreciation where we take time to ensure that people's work and efforts are valued. Asking people to include specific suggestions for how to do things differently when they offer critical feedback. And perhaps my favorite antidote is what they call developing a learning organization where it is expected that everyone will make mistakes and that those mistakes 
offer opportunities for growth. Such a learning organization fosters an environment where people can recognize that mistakes sometimes lead to positive results. What if Jesus already assumes that he is part of that kind of learning organization? Or that part of his mission is developing a group of followers who understand themselves to be part of something similar. A community of people setting out not to be perfect, but to develop a greater ability to learn from their failures. In fact, developing a body that expects transformation to come in the wake of most Failures. Maybe failure isn't even a word we should use for most situations since the mistake or shortcoming is often less important than what comes from it. In the story today, as you've heard, Jesus learns from this Gentile woman. He learns that her love for her daughter is not different from that of a mother in his own tradition. He learns that his healing is powerful beyond his own tribe. He learns that his mission can be expanded beyond what he originally thought. If that kind of learning is embarrassing to Jesus, he certainly doesn't show it. He's not embarrassed by the fact that he learned something new from a person who is probably of lesser standing than him. He's certainly not embarrassed that a woman outside of his faith teaches him something about the direction of his own. And while I know that a lot of scholars will bend over backwards to insist that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing before he was doing it, I think it's also important to ask, why do we always seem to attribute perfection to God as though being perfect is somehow better than being open to change? Whose interest does it serve to insist that the godly are people who are in charge or all-knowing? Why would we insist that these characteristics are somehow more holy than being humble, open, listening, and willing to be changed? Maybe Jesus doesn't need to be the hero of every story in order for us to learn the kind of community that he is creating with his words and his actions. In fact, the real hero of the story is the Syrophoenician woman who doesn't take no for an answer, even when she is insulted. Most of us, I think, when we get hurt, we withdraw or we try to hurt back. It's totally understandable, a very human thing. And yet, when our hurt guides us, we end up losing sight of what it is that we actually want or actually need. The hurt ends up hurting us beyond the initial wound. This Syrophoenician woman doesn't lose her focus. She wants healing for her daughter. An insult will not distract her from that goal. She refuses to take no from the one who is in a stronger position than her, offers a playful retort, and Jesus commends her for it. In fact, the primary characteristic that seems common to both the Syrophoenician woman and Jesus is their openness to possibility beyond the initial dead end that seems to be declared by Jesus. The woman stays open to the possibility that Jesus 
might be more gracious than his initial comment makes him out to be. And Jesus stays open to the possibility of learning more about his own mission from a person outside his tribe and faith. And it is their openness to greater possibility that leads to healing for this woman's daughter and even greater healing that will come for others in the future as a result of Jesus' expanded understanding of who he is sent to serve. When I think about our church's history, it is that openness that has always led us to greater blessing, openness to a Jew preaching in the pulpit all the way back in the early 1900s. Multiracial services in the 1930s. Openness to gay and lesbian people in the 70s and 80s. Openness to Salvadoran cries for justice in the 80s, to Native American testimonies in the 90s. Openness to the possibility that we might have a future on this corner in the 70s when middle class white people were fleeing the city in droves. Openness to the possibility that we might even be able to grow on this corner. That openness did not come without some interpersonal wounds. The church is brought up on charges of heresy for having an unconverted Jew preaching in the pulpit. The Afro newspaper said it's great that Brown is having a Jew preach, but why not an African-American preaching at Brown? Queer folks had to defend their identity over roundtable discussions that were not without a great deal of pain. And I've lost track of how many times we have hurt each other over questions of resources, where and how to spend them, or even what we do in worship or in mission. None of these encounters have been notable for their for perfection. And our church was and is far from heroic. But that is the wonderful thing about hospitality encounters. They are rarely without discomfort and mistakes. Some that are hurtful. And yet, when human beings are really open to the possibility that I might see something of God in you, and there may be something of God in me, transformation is always near. Maybe that's what Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman are teaching us with their encounter today. Getting things right the first time in Christian community isn't the main thing. It may be how we handle it when someone gets it wrong. Can you stay open to the possibility that God may not be finished with the encounter? That the blessing might just be in what happens on the other side of the mistake, or on the other side of the hurt.
gratitude, let us return what we are able for God's work in our church, in our city, and around the world. You may give by placing cash or a check in the offering plate when it comes around, or by using the QR code that you'll find in your bulletin, or the giving link that you'll find in the chat box on the Zoom.
person of Jesus. Give us faith to receive him, to follow him, and to serve with him in healing the world. In the light of his name and the power of your spirit. Amen. You may be seated.
I had, uh, I had lunch with a member, let's try this again, there it is. I had lunch with a member of our community this week, and um, she brought back up a conflict that we had been in maybe a year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, and she had reflected and done some work around this and shared with me uh, an apology about how she had contributed to this conflict. And in the conversation, it opened up for me what I had brought to the conflict without even being conscious of it. And I left that lunch marveling that a year and a half later, a conversation could still be had. A learning could still take place. Growth, connection, deepen between and among us. I think that is God's hope for all of us as we continue to grow together as a community of faith. So let us bring our best selves to each other in our most gracious ways of being with one another this day and every day. Speaking of gracious ways, those of you on Zoom, Janine uh, Zabriskie, the chair of the worship committee, and I are going to meet with you immediately now for 15 or 20 minutes, talk about your Zoom experience, what we can do to um, improve it. So please stay on. We'll be right on in a couple minutes. Gretchen is going to greet folks at the front door. So with that, let me offer you a benediction. Everybody needs a benediction. As you go from this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you and between you this day and every day, every day of your gifted life.